Okay, it's seven o'clock, um, and we're going to go ahead and get started with this fabulous panel, um, Immigrant Experience in Maine Schools. I'm Shanna Bellows. I'm the proud executive director of the Holocaust and Human Rights Center of Maine, and just thrilled by the interest in this program. Our mission is to inspire people to reflect and act to confront prejudice, discrimination, and intolerance. Founded by Holocaust survivors in 1985 and their allies, since 1985, we've been doing teacher education every summer on themes including how to teach about the Holocaust, but also, more recently, themes like bringing immigrant history into the classroom, making classrooms more safe and welcoming for all, teaching anti-bias and anti-racism. So we are almost at the end of a two-week teacher seminar that we title Yearning to Breathe Free. Yearning to Breathe Free. And we've been very excited to have an amazing group of teachers with us for this intensive two weeks. But one of the questions our members and supporters always ask is, what about us? Can we join too? And so tonight's panel is a spectacular group of young people who have their own immigration stories or their parents' immigration stories, um, grew up in Maine schools and are here living and working and studying in Maine and giving back to this state. They're going to share their personal experiences, what worked, what didn't, and how we can do more to make Maine a more safe and welcoming place um, for all Maine children. So with me tonight, um, I'm not going to share too much details about their bios um, because they themselves are going to tell their own stories. But we have Sophia Khalid, a Lewiston City Councilor um, I got to know Sophia through Emerge Maine and Democratic Politics, and then she came and worked for me in the legislature in the Labor and Housing Committee. She is amazing, um, and she will be speaking tonight. Howa Muhammad, Restorative Practice Coordinator for the Restorative Justice Institute of Maine. They're doing some incredible work, including work in Maine schools and communities. We're really excited to host Howa this evening. Mohammed Noor, I also know through the legislature and through his um, wonderful and passionate and informed advocacy on progressive issues as a legislative director for Maine People's Alliance, one of the premier political advocacy groups in the state. And Sahara Farah, forming, former Deering High student rep to the Portland School Board uh, for two years, a huge role, very important. She's now at Emanuel College. Um, the first time I heard Saharla speak um, was at um, the State House, probably five years ago. And I went over to her and I said, that was the most incredible speech of the day. If you ever want a job or you ever want to be in politics, please give me a call. And I think Saharla said, well, I'm, I'm only 15 or maybe it was 16, but I'll be in touch in the future. So you're in for a treat with her as well. So um, I do want to thank our sponsors. We have the next slide. Um, special thanks. Everything that we do is free this year. Um, we are doing a robust online education program uh, with our team of HHRC educators led by David Greenham, Marthine Chan, Erica Nadelhoft, and Piper Dumont, who are with us tonight. We couldn't make it free if we didn't have support from our membership, our supporters, and foundations that you see here, including, and I want to give a special shout out to Sam Cohen Foundation, the Hudson Foundation, and the Maine Community Foundation, who are particularly interested in work that we're doing around um, uh, combating anti-immigrant bias and educating folks about immigration. So the next and final thing before I turn it over to our distinguished panel, um, I would like to ask you to consider being an HHRC member. So we have over 100 people here with us tonight, um, many new names and unfamiliar names, and we were super excited about that. Under Marfine's leadership, we've dramatically increased our Facebook presence. Um, but if you could become a member, it's a $5 membership for students and teachers, $25 for individuals. Um, check out hhrcmaine.org backslash join um, and let us continue to do this powerful work. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our amazing panel. Um, and I would encourage folks um, to use speaker view 
uh, if you'd like tonight to really focus in on the panelist who's speaking, there's so many of us that if you're using, it's up in your right hand corner. If you're using the grid view, you're going to see almost everyone and it may be hard at times to tell who's speaking. So I encourage you to change it in your upper right to speaker view. So I'm going to give everybody a moment to do that. Um, and we're going to keep everyone on mute. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. Marfine and Piper will be monitoring the chat. And after each speaker has their opportunity to share their story, um, we'll be asking those questions. But we do ask you not to unmute yourselves, but to instead to use the chat um, so that we can get as many questions in as possible. So our first speaker of the night is Safiya Khalid. Welcome, Safiya. Thank you so much, Shanna. Um, it's an honor to be here, and thank you so much for including me um, to participate in this wonderful panel. Um, I know Hawa and um, Mohammed, so, and nice to meet you, Sahara. So, um, a little story about me. I came to this country at the age of seven with my family. Um, I, my first experience being in the school system was in Elizabeth, New Jersey, where, um, where it was pretty rough and challenging. I was, you know, seven years old, so um, the school, I, and I did not speak any word of English, but the school I went to, I was the only black person, and um, I was young too. I was just trying to, like, try to figure out this whole environment. Um, but one thing that I got from that school is that, um, you know, at the cafeteria, whenever I go there, or even, you know, recess at, at the park, um, my hijab was, would be taken from, um, by the other girls. They'd be like, oh, what is this? You know, they would like touch it all the time. Um, and they would just remove it from me. And I really didn't care. I didn't, I mean, I was young and my mom didn't like teach me like oh this is you have to wear this this is our religion we didn't because I we just came from Somalia and we everyone is wearing this so um but we're coming to to that school it was it was removed by me by other little girls like myself and they just wanted I think they didn't really like know anything but also they were like oh like in order for you to be like us like take it off so and and they removed it from me and I walked home without my hijab and when I got home I had a really long lecture from my mom of how to never remove your hijab and I never removed it since then or got someone else to remove it from me but coming to Lewiston um, public schools um, I I'm very thankful, like generally from, you know, from fourth grade to to um, high school, it was generally um, good, good experience. Um, I have amazing teachers that I can remember, Miss Ivers, and absolutely love her, speak with her until this day. I made great relationships, but um, I definitely did got uh, my fair share of bullying um, and Unfortunately, it was a, it was from you know Somali youth um, students classmates because I usually I always hanged out with a different crowd, and they said, oh, you know, like um, um, like do you think you're different and all of that. So I always face bullying from my Somali peers. Um, I used to walk home too from the and this was all in high school from the high school and. Um, I, I remember them like around six of them like would stand on the road wait for me and I was I, I'm still tiny um, so I was you know this tiny skinny girl and it was pretty intimidating so that that's something definitely like you know that I can remember um, but when I also graduated or towards my senior high um, senior year I uh, I went to my guidance counselor like any student would to figure out about, you know, college planning and all of that. Um, and one of the thing that my guidance counselor said to me was, you need to have a more realistic goals. Um, she, you know, pointed to my, my test, my standardized testing um, um, scores and grades and all of that and my the kind of classes I took. And um, she said, 
you know, you need to be real, realistic with yourself and put up, on, you know, like lower your standards because these colleges, you, you won't get in. They're looking at you. I was looking through my papers, my testing. And I mean, I wasn't vocal um, back then. And I really didn't like know like the systematic racism and like subtle discrimination and bias that, um, and, and I was like, I was like, well, you know, she she put she put she literally wrote cmcc on top of my paper and gave it to me um but i didn't think anything of it i didn't like push back on her i didn't tell the administration i didn't tell anyone i didn't you know i was like what is she would like i i know myself i know what i'm capable of you know i'm the first to go to any school in my entire family, the first to graduate high school, um, and for you to tell me that I'm not gonna take it. So um, I kept like thinking about that and since the Black Lives Matter movement that like that traumatic, you know, that situation really resurfaced in my head. Um, and I think I think um, a lot of a lot of black people and brown people, um, any you know, discrimination that they have faced or any racism that they have faced, like a lot of that is like resurfacing right now because this, there's this talk of um, systemic change and institutional change um, and people and like black people are, you know, being vulnerable and putting themselves and emotional labor out there to really share their stories and their experiences because a lot of white people think that, um, it doesn't happen and but they're speaking from a from a lens of privilege and a, a different you know that pr um, perspective so um we're seeing you know a lot of you know like this panel right now we're we're, we're sharing our stories and um it's, it's not like you know to it's not someone's recent say like an intellectual exercise this is not an intellectual exercise for anyone who's watching this panel but to give you a different um, point of view and a different perspective of the things that you have experienced in schools or even, you know, in, in our everyday society, because my black experience is absolutely different from your white experience. Um, and um, so, 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 you know, that's so a lot of like things are like re resurfacing and I'm like, and it's very traumatic um, experiences, honestly, and it's really hard to even share. But um, I personally, you know, as a city councilor and just as a community member who's always w willing to educate other people, um, I'm willing to share that, um, to, to share these stories. And I'm so grateful that we have, you know, people who are intentionally wanting to change the system and want to say, oh, let's center Black voices and let's hear th these experiences so that, you know, we don't just like don't do anything about it, but just so that we can change the system actually and say, this is an example of why we need to change this, you know? So um, I'm going to close it. But one thing that I really hope it's not about, you know, police reform is our education system, is our housing system. There's just so many systems that are in place that continue to, to marginalize people of color. And we shouldn't only focus on, on the police department. Um, one thing I'm going to say, Shana, I'm sorry, I'm taking forever, I feel like. Um, um, so recently, there's this, you know, this talk of like change and all of that. And a lot of the time we don't hear from the voices of the, you know, like the individuals who are impacted by these systems. And why that is, is because of systemic um, racism and like things that are like barriers that are in place from the beginning to, to, um, to keep these voices out. So right now as a city councilor and then as an advocate, right, I'm noticing that privileged people, white people are like voicing their, like, let's say there's like something on the council or on, on the school committee. We're seeing people, the privileged people speak more on an issue than the impacted. And that is because we're not centering and we are really not like getting out there and willing to like hear the voices of black and brown people. There's a lot of language barriers. There's, there's um, Somali elders and immigrants who don't have technology. They don't like, they, some, some of them don't know how to write an email, right? 
some of them don't can go like a website and like um, find the city councilors or school committee emails, right? There's so much that we really don't think about. And then we continue to create policies because we only heard from one side. And then the question becomes, why are we only hearing from one side? So, thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Sophia, um, for taking the time to be with us tonight. We really, really appreciate it. Um, Hawa, Mohammed, welcome. We're so glad to have you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you um, to everyone, really, for having me. Um, yeah, just thank you for this opportunity. I feel like I've waited 25 years to, to talk about this. Um, I feel very, like, I'm just really excited about my role at Restorative Justice Institute, and I feel like I'm finally at a place where I'm able to use that, you know, the very traumatic experiences, the frustration, and, like, just the energy and, like, the concern that I had, like, just built up energy to use. Like, I, I'm seeing, like, physical impacts of, you know, the all of the uh, trauma, really, for lack of a better word, it's uh, that I, that we faced. Um, and it feels really inspiring to know that, that, you know, there are people like me who have endured that and are making lasting changes. Um, and thank you, Sophia. Like, I think you're like the perfect example of it. You went through it, you know it. And like the fact that like, I mean, it's just, yeah, I can, I can, I'm very inspired by Sophia just in general. So like, like I, I, and I also want to make a point to you made very, very important points, and I think that there needs to be a, like a longer conversation. So, yeah, definitely, those what you said was very important. So, thank you for saying that. Um, yeah, a, a little bit of what you said, Sophia. It was, it's, it's very eye-opening and like, in, like in, insightful for me, even like, you know, for me as a person of color to hear that because it really is. Um, you, you're just reminded that not all of our experiences are the same, but there are so many like we have like the same foundation of like discrimination and like just like having to deal with that. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of similarities, but there were a lot of differences too. So that's interesting for me. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I was born in Kenya, like my parents moved here when I was just over a year old. So I did, I grew up in Portland, Maine, um, and I went through the Portland school system. My parents only spoke Somali at home. So even if I was, you know, here since I was a child, since I was a baby, I still had to learn English. So I was in English language learners classes growing up. Uh, I tested out of it, I think in second grade, but, or I think it was third grade actually. So yeah, English was definitely a struggle. I actually can remember a point. I mean, like English is essentially my main language right now, but I do remember a point when I, I was struggling to learn English. I just refused to do it. It was really hard and very confusing. So yeah, um, I went to King Middle School and I went to Portland High School. I think Portland High School was definitely a turning point for me. I feel like every time someone mentions that school, I'm just like, because <sighs> that's how it feels. I had an amazing, you know, three years at King Middle School. I think Portland High School was like a turning point for me. And I don't want to point fingers at Portland High because I can recognize that um, staff members and teachers that are, in, you know, doing incredible work now um but 10 years ago when i went i think it was 10 years ago I'm trying to do the math here i started 2009 so 2009 to 2012 um yeah 10 years ago when i went things were very very different um and i didn't have the vocabulary to uh frame my thinking i, I mean i was aware of racism like you kind of have to be um growing up but I also grew up with Somali parents who are very proud that they're Somali. So my mom kept telling me all the time, what do you mean you just uh, experienced racism in school? No, you're Somali. Remember where you're from. Like, be proud of it. Like, no, don't let these, you know, people tell you who you are. Go to these AP classes. Go to, like, advocate for yourself. And I'm realizing now, like, as much as I wanted to do that, I, I, I needed a community. I needed, like, teachers to support me. I, you know, 15 years old, like, the fact that you have to advocate for yourself is such a huge task. Um, and Sophia, I really commend the fact that you were able to do that. Like you're having conversations with your guidance counselor about, you know, switching to higher classes, like, and being told like, it's not realistic. I heard that all four years. I started 
with AP English like freshman year. And I remember my gu guidance counselor, like I'm not gonna name names, but I remember him saying like, how that's not realistic. Like just try like college English. And like, that was not a challenge, but then I was just uh, accustomed to not challenging myself. Like just, and I, I remember you just internalize that. You ter internalize so much, you internalize racism, you internalize xenophobia, you internalize so, in so many things. And you look up to these teachers. I looked up to my teachers. I looked up to my staff members or the uh, faculty members. So if my faculty member, if my guidance counselor, who is a person who I think is doing what's best for me, like I obviously should be listening to him and maybe I am not being realistic. And it really is heartbreaking to think because like I had such a like passion for English. I had such a passion for writing and reading and I, and I look back and I think, you know, what would have happened if I had staff or faculty members that fostered that um, creativity or fostered that wisdom or like the wonder that I had instead of like squash it because that's how I felt it was squashed. Um, and not all, my, not all of my experience was bad. I remember having specific teachers and I will shout them out because like they really were like so important for me. I remember having Mr. Crabtree, you know, I had lunch with him like at one point all the time me and Sama we would have like discussions about you know just like race and class and privilege and I didn't realize that these were you know I, I didn't have the language to frame my thinking but like I finally felt like and that was senior year of high school so it took some time I felt like I had a faculty member that I could really trust um yeah so that was that's really important for me to, to know and I want to also mention the microaggressions um, and I put that in quotations because there's really nothing micro about it. There's nothing minor about it. It's like constant, it's like a steady level of, of abuse that you're facing. So it's not really, it, there's nothing minor about it, but the microaggressions that I faced uh, and all of that really came from adults, the adults in my life. The like I didn't have any bullying from students and my peers. They really, like the white students left me alone. And honestly, like I see that as a blessing now. Like I had my friends, I had my support group, you know, things were a little segregated because we just didn't understand each other. But I had like my Somali support group and we were having like counseling sessions with each other after school every single day. And I, I didn't even realize that that was something that I really needed, but I had to, I had to vent with my friends about like all of the microaggressions that we faced that day because it was a constant level of it. Um, yeah, so it was just mostly staff members, all the adults in my life. Like I remember when I think about like the experiences, the negative experiences that I had in schools, like it was my staff members telling me how well, you need to be realistic, how I don't know if you can do this and just finding other ways to say that to me, the same message over and over again. Yeah, so, and it definitely happened when I applied to college. I remember one specific conversation that happened in my homeroom. Um, it was around the same, t it was around right before graduation and my homeroom teacher was going around and she was asking kids, you know, Natalie, what college are you going to? Barry, what college are you going to? And then I remember her moving to me, the only black person in the room, the only, you know, woman of color, the only Muslim person in the room, only immigrant in the room, like coming to me and like, she's hesitating a little bit. She's like, uh, uh, how are you going to college? That's what she said. And I still remember that to this day. And like that, like that will stick with me. And I, I will like that, the energy and the frustration and all of that, that comes from that. Like I made it a point to use that for good. I work with um, Lyman Moore Middle School right now, uh, just as a restorative justice coordinator. I am working with schools, with um, kids in schools that are, are growing this frustration and not, and realizing they don't have a safe place to talk openly about it. You know, like I'm organizing focus groups, I'm organizing and really wanting to make sure youth are empowered to talk openly about the, the discrimination that they're facing and find a way to make lasting changes in response to it. And that is like my number one goal. I told myself that in high school and like, I feel really good about where I am right now. And I know like, this is like the work that I, that I meant to do. So yeah, thank you for um, just like allowing me the, the space to really talk about this. I feel like this is almost like a venting session for all of us, but yeah, we, I think these conversations are really, really important. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. How, thank you so much for being so honest and um, for the work that you're doing right now in schools, that is was truly inspirational. 
Um, and shout out to the Restorative Justice Institute. Again, another really important organization doing some great work um, in Maine schools and a resource for teachers and administrators who are with us tonight. Um, I'm going to turn it now over to Mohammed Noor. And um, Mohammed, would you like to share uh, your story um, as the son of immigrants, a first generation? First, uh, let me thank, thank you, Shana, for creating the space and the platform for us to talk about these issues. And again, I just want to thank Sophia and Hawa for a lot of what you both said resonated. Um, and it's making me think about, making me reflect on my own experience differently. So thank you for what you said and for all the great work that you both do. Um, so for my, my personal history, um, so my family, my mother came to, came to Maine in 1993, um, right after the Somali Civil War. Um, and my, my sister and myself, we were born a couple years later. Um, so we were born and raised in Portland. Uh, we learned English and Somali simultaneously. Um, so we grew up in Portland public schools. I went to Reiki Elementary, King Middle, Deering High, um, and a lot of and a lot of the bias and the discrimination that Howe and Sophia mentioned. Like I definitely endured that and suffered that as well. Um, there were a lot of microaggressions, not only from students, from you know, like just stupid thing, from saying stupid stuff like "you're a pirate," "you're a terrorist," just really hurtful and awful things to um, actually hearing it from staff members and teachers, uh, or not reinforce it, but um, be silent on that. Um, and that was really hurtful and that was really painful. Um, so for like the majority of my, my academic experience in Portland public schools, I had this identity crisis, right? Of um, I was born in Portland, um, I was raised here, um, but I'm always seen as different or I'm always seen as othered by my classmates and by my teachers um, for the way that I look, for um, my language, my language uh, capabilities, um, being low income, being black, being Muslim in Maine, um, that was very present and that was very um, at the forefront of my consciousness, right? I think I didn't have the language, I didn't have the tools to really articulate those experiences, but I definitely felt that and can identify that when I saw it in schools. Um, and for me, I think high school is a turning point for me as well. I went to doing high school and um, that was, that was really the first time I met educators and staff members who really uh, supported me and really believed in me. I think up until that moment, um, I've been in schools with teachers who, um, for whatever reason, um, would uh, underestimate my ability, would, um, wouldn't make the effort to um, contact my family in the, same way, in the same way they would with other students. Um, it just felt that I was in the margins of the classroom at all times. And at Deering, um, I remember my, like my first day of high school, I walked into um, this, this classroom um, and it was this hub of like immigrant students, students of color. Um, it was the most like diverse room I've been in at the, up until that point. Um, and it was in the program of, in the program that, um, that housed it was called the Make It Happen program, which was a, um, college, college readiness program uh, designed specifically to support immigrant students and the children of immigrant students. Um, and that was really the first time where I actually had conversations about college that didn't end with, you're not, you, you can't go to college. That's an unrealistic expectation for you. Uh, that actually believed in me that went out of their way to uh, include and um, include my mother in these conversations, right? Um, from taking me to college, college visits to um, encouraging me to sign up for AP classes. Um, I had um, like teachers like Mrs. Lunt, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Mr. Landry, um, other just like a score of teachers who really believed in me and saw a potential in me that I didn't see in myself. Um, so I'm really grateful to have met those teachers then. Um, but that being said, that was a handful of teachers out of hundreds of teachers who have dismissed me, who have um, ignored me, have ignored um, the times when I would uh, bring up the issues, these issues, right, of diversity and inclusion, of, of, of like discrimination, of racism, of bias, um, and it just wasn't taken seriously. Um, so I really credit like these extracurricular programs like Make It Happen, like Seeds of Peace, and these great community organizations that were in the Portland area that um, you know, gave me a voice. I didn't know, I didn't have a voice up until that point. Um, 
I didn't think I was important. I didn't think my voice mattered. And it really was when I met this, these group, this group of teachers who showed me the value of my own voice, who really inspired me to, to use it, to, to use it to advocate for myself and for the people who, and for people who look like me and who experienced the same things as I did. Um, and I wish that was true for all students of color, immigrant students across the state of Maine, but that isn't the case and it absolutely should be. Um, it is really sad that it took up until high school for me to feel included and welcomed in school. Um, but now I'm seeing, but now I'm seeing a change um, in the ways in which schools are talking about these issues and which I, compl which I really envy now. Um, I wish I had that back then as well. Um, but those programs saved me, if I'm going to be honest. They reignited this flame of education that my mother had for me, uh, made me believe in myself, and ultimately got me to college. Um, college was somewhat on my radar, but as being like the son of like immigrants, um, the college application process, um, financial aid, those were all new and very scary things to deal with. And um, I couldn't necessarily, I didn't have like that parental support that all my friends did. Um, so I would spend hours, um, you know, in the make it happen room with like my mother and Mr. Cronin, who was the coordinator, um, literally working through my financial aid application, um, telling me, oh no, you should apply to this school as well. Cause you, that, that isn't, um, that shouldn't be a safety for you. You can actually get in. Um, and that, and that made the difference for me. So when I, unfortunately I was able to go and graduate from college and, um, and, and, and I went and I was able to stay in college uh, and go to college in Maine. And part of that was I wanted to be here to show, to help support students like me in high school who um, had these similar dreams of wanting to go to college, of wanting to give back to their community, um, wanting to support one another where those support systems didn't necessarily exist. Um, and I'm happy to see more and more Maine immigrant students um, like take those opportunities and really run with it and have their voices be heard and doing incredible work across the state. Um, and, and it's been beautiful to see um, that kind of passion, that resilience and um, how far they're going and to be a part of that in, in the small way that I am has been very rewarding and, and humbling. Thank you so much. That is a truly, truly uplifting and inspiring um, story. Really appreciate it. Um, our next and last panelist is Saharla Farah. Saharla, welcome. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. And I'd also like to thank you for the opportunity to complete the very Saharla, I'm going to interrupt. Your audio is a little, little low. Can we try to adjust it a little higher? Yeah, I'm so sorry. How do I go about that? No problem. Should I? Okay. So how do I do that? I'm sorry. That's great. You got it. Oh, so I just have to speak louder. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> okay. I was thanking you for the opportunity to speak, and I was also acknowledging all the other speakers. It was great to listen to all of your experiences, seeing the crossovers and how there's a lot of intersection um, and all of that. Um, so I wanna thank everyone for hearing your experience and giving yourself out in that way. Um, so I'm gonna do the same. Um, um, so my, I also like to start with my mother coming to America in um, 1992, um, that coming to Georgia. So I was born in Atlanta along with my brothers and then we, um, it's interesting that the uh, education in main schools is our conversation today because I think that formed a lot of the reason we came to Maine at all um, for better education opportunities, safer um, ideals. And I know that's, so I know Georgia and Maine are quite different, both culturally, geographically, and just in general um, coming for that better school experience. Um, we came to Lewiston first and I don't have, uh, we were there for elementary school. I'm gonna say, I, it's not we, but the rest and my brother's a little older. Um, but the elementary school experience in Montello and Longley School, so there for a little while, um, but ultimately moving to South Portland. And for my middle school experience, actually getting the opportunity to go to the French School of Portland, which I really value that experience. And I'm really happy to actually see one of my former educators, Mary Tracy, um, watching today. And just I think that's just another example of 
great educators and examples like that in Maine, um, teaching language, English, and those different um, types. Sorry, I just have to do that quick thing, but sidebar, but um, the French School of Portland, and I feel like that in comparison to my time at Deering, or even um, in the small case of Macaulay, how those all, those different experiences, um, for example, um, in the French School, I feel like a lot of the curriculum and just day-to-day life a lot was it around kind of identity and valuing kind of the individual person and those not saying that the Portland public schools don't possess that but I think they had a more intimate um, opportunity to do that so that's a different way um, of educating that I really valued and having the chance to bring um, a lot of those experiences there and I feel like um, Howell made a good point about um, needing kind of spaces to vent almost the people that look like you and although I really value the education and the people that I um, was exposed to at the French school it is not the very most the, the most diverse um, school so needing that kind of space to be one with yourself and owning that like oh, okay I'm also a student but I'm also a black student a Muslim student first generation student I have um, my parents look different and sound different than um, a lot of people so having that um, so that reminds me of the King Fellows where I'm working with Martin Luther King Jr. Fellows so that with um, Representative Talbot Ross when she had the time to do that. So that was an amazing experience to come at, even though it's once a week, it's just a room of people that look like you and the stories are similar and your frustrations that seem so small and almost like no one might get that. Living a person of color in Maine, um, you are seen and heard and you, uh, we had the opportunity to bring that to different spaces to be seen and heard similarly to this panel and listening and all those um, different factors. So I was really grateful for that experience. Um, so that helped me through my middle school, um, even into, like I mentioned, Deering. So I feel like I, by high school, I was equipped with a certain mindset that I was um, grateful for having that duality almost, like not saying you have to operate differently around people of color and other such, but um, having that, just that duality in that case and being, having the opportunity um, to sit on the school board as a student representative and as I'm talking about Deering and other educators that helped me um, through there. Um, I see Helen Bright in here as well as Jen Lunt that Mohammed answered. I mean, ooh, I'm sorry, um, answered, yeah, mentioned. Um, and um, the point I was trying to make that I feel like a lot of the educators that I felt most seen and heard from kind of fell back on the subject they were teaching. So learning um, interpretation and how interpretation works in Maine and seeing um, how like how um, translators are really important having those classes with Miss Lunt and so just how that's a huge thing in Maine how a lot of people need um, a translator or things along those lines so having that class opportunity um, is really important and I think stuck with me now as an alum so you see those things or Miss Bryant with her human geography and actually showing uh, Somali women and those things that in your classroom so having that representation even though the numbers might not be there but kind of affirming that that's still a value just showing that is extremely important and um, I just I think a lot of my materials coming from seeing their faces right now but I had another thing to say but I, I don't mind that as well um, but kind of how the Portland Public Schools um, value that global perspective, um, I think comes out in certain classrooms, but I feel like it's kind of there's a disparity given the course perhaps, or maybe if teachers wanna push that narrative or definitely there are some teachers that do that more than others. Um, sometimes I feel like we fall short in certain areas because although we do have perhaps the diversity, um, not, um, kind of, if you don't, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm sorry. Um, if you have the numbers, however, I had a little note, but I'm just gonna get rid of that. Like if you have the numbers, however, if you're not kind of getting into that and knowing their experience and trying to actually tap into the numbers that you have, just having the population is not always enough. So I think I saw that, um, but I won't keep rambling. Um, kind of, but I just, that's just a little intro that I had. Well, 
it was perfect because one of the things that we asked each of you to do is just speak to your authentic experience and what you were moved to say to teachers who might be watching today. So thank you so much, Saharla. And um, thank you also for acknowledging that some of the teachers that had a, such a positive influence on your life and some of the other speakers here are um, with us tonight. That's really incredible. Um, so we have some wonderful questions in the chat and we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. So I'm going to get started with some of the ones that were populated in the chat already. Although definitely members of the public who are watching at home, um, please feel free um, to uh, add, add, to the, add to the chat. So the first question is from a teacher who said she has 12 senior advisees this upcoming year. Um, so reflecting on the advice that you received as seniors, particularly as you were looking at your future, what are some of the things that you would recommend? You, you know, Sophia, you talked about the don'ts and, and actually each of you touched on the don'ts. What are the do's? What, what, are, what is good advice for an advisor with senior advisees? Um, working with students who are immigrants or um, come from immigrant families. And um, let, let's go ahead in the order. Um, uh, Sophia, why don't you start, um, given your very compelling story about your meeting with your counselor. Thank you, Shanna. Um, I think we need to, um, like, first amplify students of color, their voices, and we really need to, like, intentionally listen to them and support them. There's a lot of, throughout my high school, um, one of the biggest gap that I have seen is that a lot of Somali parents or, you know, um, immigrant parents don't, they're not like more in, in the school system. They don't visit the school system. So we really need to build that connection. How do you bridge the gap of like parents getting into the school? And, and then we also need to ask our the question why aren't, aren't pa parents coming to the schools because of the language barrier because of these systems because of administration because maybe they they feel like it's a foreign to them they they can't um, build those relationships so it's us it's up to the educators and up to these you know, advisees and these administrators to step up to build that connection and build that gap um one last thing that i will say is um really like supporting students of color um, and, and, and really not like crushing their ambitions. And, um, and you know, the sky is, is yeah, the sky is, is the limit. Um, well, not anymore, but so you really need to um, give them all the advice that you can and don't come from a perspective of, like, you know, a privilege and like, you can do this, you can do that, etc. Be very open minded and give them all the options. Treat them the same as you know, the other white student that came 20 minutes ago. Don't tr treat them any different because of the color of their skin. Thank you. That's profound advice. Um, any of the other panelists, um, Mohammed or Saharla? Um, uh, do either of you have advice for that advisee of seniors? I would like to sum up what Sophia was saying. Um, I think I was going to actually talk about bridging between parents, and that's a big one. That's a big disparity. Um, but also, sometimes I like to think about almost the trauma exploitation of some first generation students or even immigrant students or refugee. I feel like, although a lot you put your experience in your college application and things like that, I feel like sometimes there's a certain push to almost only do that and then that's I feel that there's an issue of now kind of having to exploit yourself for that application so I feel like I've seen that happening a lot of students almost being drained to like over um not overly navigate their experiences but almost kind of having to pick at it in a way for so I feel like that should be in a, a at least that is something that would be spoken on in your essay or things of that nature, but approaching that in a more sensitive way, I feel like sensitivity and different training would be um, advisable for how to go about um, certain conversations with your students in a more humane way, I think, too. Thank you. Uh, Mohammed. do you have advice or Hawa? Yeah. Um... I can go with Muhammad. Yeah, great. 
I just want to, so I get asked that question a lot. And I think uh, what happens as a response is I just, I'm just curious about the school culture. You know, they're, they're, the insights of uh, students of color only go a certain, you know, only go a certain way if the, if the response to it isn't sufficient. So if a student of color, you know, has actual like concerns about, you know, this specific system at the school, like it's really up to the staff and the faculty to respond to it. So I'm just curious about the actual power that, you know, the students hold, if they hold actual power um, if they have any, um, if they're in the room when it comes to structural changes in the school. So it's really, it, it goes beyond that. I think we need to make a commitment to cater to our students really um, and make sure we're examining ourselves and examining the school culture and make and making sure that there's a structural change in the school culture that fosters, you know, the, uh, uh, the concerns of students, like the valid concerns of students. So I think that's probably the first step is really looking at ourselves are looking at the faculty at the school first, making sure that whatever they say, you know, their actual concerns and their ideas for leadership for changes in school can actually, you know, become physical things, physical changes in the school. So I just want to like plant that curiosity in everybody's mind. Are, do we have places, do we have the uh, culture in place for that to happen when they, you know, come up with actual concerns? So that's just something to think about. Mohammed, do you have advice? And then I have a question that was directed to you from the chat. Any advice for the for the advisor to senior advisees? Uh, no, I would no. I would agree with everything that's been said. Um, okay. So, so here's the question that came from the chat. Um, I'm very interested to hear more about safe spaces and having to navigate those, and wondering whether those are ghettoizing. Um, Mohammed, you were in a freshman seminar targeting support needs for upper level EL students. Saharla, you were in an asset based class on interpretation and translation. In both cases, I was the white educator in the room facilitating a person of color space. Do you have thoughts about how schools with majority white spaces can create structures that allow people of color only spaces where students can feel safe? to express themselves. So Mohammed, you first, and then Saharla, since you were named, and then if anybody else has any thoughts on, on the idea of safe spaces um, for students of color. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, first, let me, let me say that um, those safe spaces are definitely essential and critical for students of color. Um, I think in particular case of that class um, um, with the uh, freshman seminar, um, I think that experience is different because there was like an intentionality that um, she brought into the classroom and into the conversations and really would center like our voices and our experiences and have us lead a lot of the conversations, um, which I think made the classroom, made, made the class much more. Uh, I mean, you're fading a little out. Can you speak uh, just a little um, hi uh, louder? <laughs> Sorry. About that. Um, yeah, so, um, I think um, that classroom that Ms. Lunt described, uh, I think she did a really good job of centering our voices and our experiences um, in the classroom, in those conversations. Uh, I think it's really hard when there aren't, uh, when there aren't um, faculty and staff of color at the school. Like that representation is important. Um, I didn't have my first black ed like, teacher until college. Um, so in terms of relating to like the bias and discrimination that we would face at Deering, um, it was hard to talk about those experiences with white educators, even those who were like the most well-intentioned. Um, I think those spaces are important. I think they definitely have to be both within and like outside of the classroom as well. I think academically, for me, uh, one where all students feel respected and heard and their opinions are validated. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's just great. Oh, you just muted out again. Oh, I'm so sorry. sorry everyone. <laughs> what was your last couple sentences? Um, yeah, just like tailoring the classroom and the conversation to the students in the room. Yeah. Um, so Harla, do you want to comment on this? Um, also, haven't been one of in one of those safe spaces, and how that how schools can create that. 
So I think this one's question is surrounding like how do we allow that people of color, people of color space? I was been rereading the question, sorry, because I want to have a concise answer, but I just want to fall back a little on the term ghettoizing. I feel like that in itself almost kind of sets a tone that like a majority um, people of color classroom is other or kind of is like almost like not the norm and even though that could be the case in a lot of situations in our schools I feel that almost advances it and I know that you said you had like you negated this conversation and I know in my experience in schools um, or um, specifically during how we started a or not we um, I was a part of her a little bit, but I graduated, but it's implemented my senior year, um, a black student union. And that in itself, I feel like, like had a, a big conversation whether, like, is that okay almost to have this space loudly be directly and specifically only for black students. And I feel like that was almost intimidating to a lot of the population. So I feel like both in the classroom or even extracurriculars, this, having a space regarded exclusively for people of color is seen, like I said, like almost in, in a negative. Um, so I feel like going back to the question, I'm sorry, I feel like I derailed a little bit. It's okay. um, yeah, <laughs> being in the classroom with um, this, uh, the white educator, I feel like a structure that could be um, put into place is just the, as simple as almost your word and like your merit, like being behind as a white educator, you're acknowledging your words hold more merit than certain um, levels as like maybe a student as myself, a student of color. So backing that in a way and opening that, um, making sure that these platforms have a space to be built. So I feel like that could start at that ground level even in that case. Um, but Or even co-signing, um, I feel like we didn't have a lot of co-signers for like the Black City Union or for things like that because I feel like it's seeing people's mistakes like divide, but it, it is thriving now. I'm not gonna say that it's not the case, but I'm just showing that a little of the struggles that could be at like the ground work. Um, I'm gonna wrap it up there. But. Thank you. Um, in the chat, Representative Rachel Talbot Ross um, makes the point that LD 1050 is a piece of legislation in the legislature right now that mandates the study of African American history and the history of genocide um, and actually uh, the Holocaust. It was not funded by the Democratic majority in the state legislature for a mere $9,000. It sits today on the appropriations table. Um, Representative Talbot Ross and I have been advocating for that piece of legislation because it seems like such a sh simple shift. But there are multiple questions in the chat and I'm gonna actually, given that we're going to wrap up at eight o'clock, um, I'm gonna merge two questions and that is how does curriculum need to change and how do policies need to change to address racism and bias in the schools? And um, Sophia, I know you've watched what happens at the State House. You're more familiar than many people are with the political process, and now you're entering into public policy and politics yourself. Um, do you want to start with your recommendations for changes um, to curriculum and to policy? And then anyone can jump in from the panel. Please do. Yes, Shanna, thank you. Um... So three recommendations. One, we really need to diversify our public schools. Um, I can't speak for Portland Public Schools, but I know that Lewiston Public Schools definitely lacks that diversity where the population, the student population, um, there's, you know, at least I think more than 20% POC students. So we need to really look at educators who have similar experience and similar background as to the students so that they can relate to them and they can be there for them intentionally and very sincerely. Um, so that's one. And I always hear this pushback of, oh, we do put applications out there, but no one's hiring. Yeah, we live in Maine, but we really need to be actively engaged in looking for um for these people to to recruit them and even what about um the LRTC right where we can like get kids inspired to become teachers in their home, own um, um hometowns where they can go back and stay after and and teach elementary schools oh. where black students can grow up with teachers i i had two black teachers 
and Mr. Zach from middle school is here tonight, so I'm very happy. Um, and Miss McManus, um, but that's you see, that's the only two teachers that I can name. How crazy is that? We we need to do better. Um, the other thing is standardized testing. We need to completely get rid of that because it's founded on an institution, right? A systematic institution of racism that continues to really not uplift the abilities of you know all students and all people, but like only select few. So especially where someone who, let's say recently came from Africa who doesn't speak English, but you have to like, you're basically judged off of standardized testing where a lot of kids have been going to preschool since, you know, since they were um, very young and uh, we're just, we need to be all in the same playing field, but we're not. So, and then like, we don't even emphasize a lot, like guidance counselors, colleges don't say like, um, you know, don't really put the, don't really emphasize the how much they judge the students because of a test. But then again, when when they do take the test, they're like, oh well, your test is so low, I can't really like you can't go into this college or you can't take AP classes because of an standardized testing. But then again, you didn't like make a big deal out of it, so why are you making a big deal out of it right now, right? So completely get rid of that, and we really like need to reimagine um and like get get students into the community and into real like real life things that they can actually do like taxes and all these other things that are actually can really help us and support us thank you so much so we have three minutes <laughs> and we could talk for an hour about education policy change and um curriculum changes um hawa or saharla or muhammad um, do you have something that you're dying to say about those issues? Um, because we definitely, um, your voices are so important. Your expertise is really so important. Yeah, I just wanted to say really quick, um, just responding to safe spaces. You know, this was not a thing 10 years ago, but I'm really energized and inspired by the fact that, you know, faculty are realizing this is very necessary. You know, at, at RJM, we call them affinity groups. I saw Tiffany Demarest, you know, in this chat, I was just a few weeks ago before, I mean, months ago before COVID, you know, we were talking about safe spaces um, for students. We were talking about affinity groups. I, I work with, you know, the fierce girls and, you know, these middle school students who, without having the language already, realized how important it was for them to have safe spaces. So that they are happening, students want them, and we just need to listen to them. Um, and I also want to make, I just want to repeat the point that Sophia had a really good point that, you know, she recognizes some people from her middle school here. Um, sorry, that's my cat meowing. Um, she recognizes <laughs> some people from middle school here that, you know, have showed up, but where's the rest of the faculty? Where are the rest of the teachers? And I just, I don't, I want to just make it a point, like these relationships with teachers, they stick with us forever. I remember like, you know, Mrs. Hillman in the fourth grade, Mr. Cronin, um, Miss Colella, who really like inspired, and she's here too, like Miss Colella is here. Like you were so like, so important to me. You were one of the very few faculty or the teachers that, you know, really like saw me as a student. And I carry that with me now, I'm 26 years old. It's been some time since middle school. And I just want to like, thank you from the bottom of my heart for like, sorry, I really don't want to get emotional, but you know, like that sticks with you. like. That these are our experiences and like it just it, it stays with us it stays with us through our adulthood it impacts is, it impacts the you know the um uh, the steps and the uh our impact in the world like it just i just want to it's indescribable how important um teachers are for us so i just want people to just really like listen to their students um you know take advantage of the fact that like take use your privilege but also like um just be cognizant of the space that you take up so yeah i just wanted to say that thank you all for being here thank you all for listening to us like this is important this is the first step in a series of changes and conversations to have absolutely um uh muhammad do you have anything final words that you want to say to the group Oh, but speaking really close to your computer. <laughs> Sorry for the audio problems. No uh, yeah, I think just echoing what Howard said, um, this has to be the first of many conversations. And 
part of the conversation, students have to be at the center of that. Students have to be at the conversation, have to be leading it, um, have to listen. Um, in the classroom, in the classroom. Can you say that last sentence one more time, really loud? I heard you have to listen, and then I it blanked out. Listen to them both in the classroom and then outside of the classroom. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I do want to say um, all of our speakers are willing to come to your school if you're interested in replicating a panel for a professional development day for teachers or hosting some sort of workshop for students. Um, but we think it's really important, Sophia um, touched on this and, and I think how I mentioned the word as well, the emotional labor that it takes to talk about these traumas and to talk about these experiences. So one of the philosophies at the HHRC is we do not ask our presenters to um, do this work for free. So we ask that if you invite them, you be sure to pay them the honorarium that you would pay um, to a white speaker that you might be inviting to do professional development um, at your school or public speaking at your school. That's a really important um, piece of this representation is not asking black, indigenous, and people of color to do this work for white people for free. Um, so Harla, any final words in terms of policy changes, education, or just a shout out to the group um, before we uh, conclude our, this far too short of an evening, but a really, really wonderful and inspiring session. Um, I just love listening to everyone speak so eloquently, and I agree with every point that they make, and I have the chance to just, I've been looking through, I've been snooping through the chat as well, and like seeing that um, all the points everyone's making, so I'm just really appreciative to be a part of such a um, network um, of uh, information and experience and kind of um, networking all around and just really appreciative of the educators that I've had and all the um, experience that I got to share with them and also all the knowledge that I get to take away and also all of that um, policy specifically. I just feel that like there should be just more funding and grounding for training, um, anti-bias uh, training, uh, conscious, unconscious biases because the way that that can work into education is major, it's huge. Uh, we see it every day but um, I feel like we're not very serious enough. We don't think that that's um, it's, it's urgent, but it's really urgent to um, have these trainings because the students are coming in and leaving. Um, and like everyone has said, there's people hold on to a lot of things from their schooling and a lot. You, everyone wants to hold on to all of it, um, learning and all that, but the social experience and that interpersonal relationship you have with your teachers and those authority figures, it sticks with you. Um, so having that education and wanting to be better for the sake of your students, I feel like that needs to be at the forefront of a lot of whatever policy that is being brought forward, just bringing the, I think, humanity back into policy work and all those things. That's all. Thank you so, thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, if you enjoyed tonight, uh, we are gonna be having another very similar um, panel um, at, on August 13th, uh, one of the things that Representative Talbot Ross and our education chair who's with us tonight, um, educator Adelaide Solomon Jordan, um, both of them are uh, African Americans who talk a lot about how it's important not to put all black, indigenous, and people of color in the same group or expect that everyone has the same experiences. On August 13th, we'll be doing a very similar panel, 7 p.m., a panel of African-American um, Mainers who grew up in Maine schools and some of the structural racism that they encountered and what they think needs to happen for change. So please save the date for August 13th um, for our, the next panel that we're having in this series. And if you liked what you saw tonight, first, thank you to our sponsors, but also our individual members and supporters. So if you're a student or a teacher, join the HHRC um, at hhrcmaine.org backslash join for a mere $5 to support human rights and Holocaust education. Um, and if you're an individual, uh, you can make a larger donation of 25 um, if you would. Uh, we appreciate all of you so much. It's a privilege to be in this room tonight. 
Um, round of applause, virtual or real, you can use the, um, I think somebody said, said to me privately in the chat, I'm dying to use the clap or the thumbs up function. So let's do a clap and thumbs up function for our amazing panelists. Thank you, Hawa, Saharla, Sophia, Muhammad. You are rock stars and we are so grateful. And thank you to the 130 plus people who were here with us for most of the evening. Um, Thank you very much. This is how we make positive change in Maine. Good night, everybody.